All right, you guys, and welcome back. Um, sorry about that. I was, wasn't was ready to go live yet, but anyway, um, this is a quick how-to tutorial on how to go about breeding your Palmacia brigidae, which is your just your common mystery snails, which come in different variants and colors and so forth. Um, so you can see here we got some uh, goldens. We got some ivory. And then once in a while I get a little bit of chocolate, but for the most part, uh, these are the ones that uh, we've been producing for uh, quite some time now. Uh, so with that being said, I've had some questions come up lately as far to, as far as going about breeding. I did have a video out at one point, but it looks as if I actually removed that video uh, at one point or another uh, within my playlist. So uh, we're just going to do a quick how-to tutorial, kind of getting back to my roots. This is what I used to do. So completely raw unedited uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on here about 10 15 minutes and i'm going to go ahead and wrap it up to try to provide the most insight and information i can to you guys uh, in order to inspire you if you're looking at doing a mystery snail so keep in mind with this specific variant of snail you will need a male and female and i can go ahead and link once this is done uh, imaging in order to give you a side-by-side -side comparison on the identification between a male and a female uh, in order to get the appropriate reproduction that you're looking for. I do recommend that you start out with a group of 10 or 12. We do carry these on the website. However, the size that you'll be obtaining them at is going to be anywhere between 3 16ths to a quarter inch in size, uh, which is something close to about this and that. And given the appropriate recommendations that I'm going to talk about here over the next few minutes, I have nothing but confidence uh, if you apply some of these techniques, and again, keep in mind that the variables between mineral content disposition that we have in our various setups for which we breed these is going to differ from that of which you guys are actually going to have. So just because it works here effectively doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be working uh, the, the same way uh, within your ecosystem. Uh, so with that being said, one of the first techniques that I would recommend, and I talked about this on the live stream, is you're going to see here a piece of slate which goes across. Um, and the reason I do this is you can see here the water level I can actually keep right here, uh, which is typical water level. We usually like to see just from an aesthetics point of view, if you look at it here, it is slightly down below uh, just because of the way I have this overflow set up. However, I could essentially raise this up, but the manipulation here is due to the fact I have a piece of floating driftwood, uh, which a lot of the ancestors will actually use as hides in order to actually, uh, same thing with shrimp, they can actually burrow themselves in there and they will start reproducing. Same thing with snails. Uh, you can see here lots of clutches all the way around. And again, this is uh, essentially how I incubate. Rather than pulling them, there's enough humidity and so forth in order to keep the appropriate moisture distribution over these eggs uh, so they can maintain um, the overall structure that they need to in order to then hatch out. Um, you can see here, um, don't have any clutches currently. Uh, it looks like in this specific tank to show you on the glass. However, the same concept uh, will, will hold true. And you can see here a small clutch from a young, uh, young mystery snail there. I can tell uh, is probably new, getting the feel for it. Um, so just use a flat piece of slate is another recommendation I have. And uh, they'll do the same thing. They'll actually come up, same process. If you've actually seen um, mystery snails, actually the way that they go up and actually will clean the surface and then come back and actually distribute uh, the clutches is a pretty unique and pretty interesting um, thing to, to observe. So there is lots of videos out there um, on on that. Uh, however, I'm just telling you what has worked for me through the years. And as you can see, I literally have bred thousands and I do distribute those in various tanks. And I can literally get every one of these tanks um, applying the same tactics uh, that I'm going to be talking about in order to get them to breed effectively. Um, this one here is on a continuous drip. As you can tell, I'm changing lots of water. Therefore, I don't have to worry about any mulm or detritus based on the balancing that's happening within the ecosystem in order to maintain the appropriate levels that I'm looking for. The overall TDS I recommend um, with breeding these guys effectively anywhere between 180 to 400, even 4, 420 to 
cold dissolved solids, but keep in mind, TDS is a very complex and um, from a scientific breakdown, uh, unless we have a chemist lab to actually understand what told dissolved makeup is actually happening within the distribution of the water column is going to be quite difficult to definitively tell but based on a baseline our, our municipal water source I find that they breed um, all day long in that specific range. Um, a temperature in this specific setup is going to be anywhere between 68 and 75 degrees um, so again that range as far as water temperature I find that they do uh, phenomenally well uh, so you don't necessarily have to increase um, the overall water temperature in order to get a yield that you're looking for uh, the other thing is as far as food goes uh, they will feed on uh, baby carrots uh, they'll also feed on um, green beans uh, any cichlid pellets that we add to the tank so really any of that to maintain an appropriate balance between carbohydrates and proteins I find will help entice and kind of inhibit some of those uh, spawning moves and behaviors and obviously keep in mind that this one is on a continuous drip however not every one of them are on a continuous drip and I still even without the continuous drip applying the other methods that I'm mentioning have found a good yield and success uh, with the distribution that I'm looking for and uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the overall pH in most of our setups is going to be anywhere between 7, 7 to 8, 2 maybe even 8, 3. Uh, so based on those um, quote unquote uh, water parameters is what I find effective. So the greatest tip I can recommend is a piece of driftwood set up like this, um, either a piece of slate. Uh, again, you can drop the water level down, which we can take a look at a tank over here uh, where the water level is actually dropped down. Same thing, this one's on a continuous drip. You can see a clutch here clutch back there which already um, hatched out this one over here and then uh, this is a community breeding setup we got some uh, Curbinzas poultures in here we got some Ancestris placos between albinos and the chocolate variant uh, lots of the mystery snails um, and so forth so again they do phenomenally well same conditions for what we just looked at in the 55 is very similar to this. So let's take a look at another setup where I am not on a continuous drip necessarily. So bear with me just a second you guys. knocking my uh, my airline hoses loose here it's always fun doing this one-handed all right I think we're good to go let's head on over to the other fish room hopefully I won't lose you guys um, so this one here same concept this is a 20 long uh, and you can see clutches distri distributed all around there. So again, um, just give it time. A lot of these guys in this tank are quite young. Um, so, you know, they're going to be kind of new at this. And generally the clutches are going to um, remain a little bit smaller. But as they get, get the hang of it and as they continue to start breeding, um, then you'll start to notice those get a little bit larger, such as what we've seen um, in the, the previous fish room. So you can see here we got some green beans and you can see here you guys a shell structure based on that one pound of crushed coral per 10 gallons of water and we are fortunate enough to have the appropriate um, hardness, uh, general hardness and so forth uh, to maintain as well as calcium. Uh, I don't supplement with anything special as far as any additional and you can see if we grab even this ivory absolutely stunning um, no no pitting no issues as far as um, uh, that goes uh, same thing with the golds here again and uh, another thing to keep in mind do not be alarmed if you see one of these uh, sitting at the bottom of your tank 
and not moving. They literally, at times, uh, will not move for 48 to 72 hours and you'll think that they're dead. Um, in order to identify if they've become deceased and expired, is you're just gonna go ahead and lift it out and then do a sniff test and you will know immediately by far one of the, the worst smells that you'll find in this hobby, I find, through the years is being able to identify if one of these have become uh, deceased. And again, a lot of that's with age and other factors that can go into that. Um, but for the most part, these are by far one of my favorite uh, in order to breathe. They're not difficult whatsoever. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Um, so that's about it, you guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed that uh, quick how-to. And um, like I said, we're not going to make it a long video. Kind of getting back to my roots, doing, doing raw, unedited um unscripted videos um and so forth so if there's anything that i missed as far as questions go you can go ahead and leave it after this is uploaded down in the comment section below and i'll ensure that i get back with you guys so hopefully that somewhat makes some sense um i'll take one or two questions i'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up let's see i had a snail die uh lifted it up out of the tank fell out stunk like heck let's see here so alright you guys um, like I said I'm not sure how long looks like about 12 minutes I uh, don't want to push this much past that so if there's any I'll take one question uh, good question relevant to what we're talking about here and then I'm gonna go ahead and conclude this um, and then hopefully this will help somebody uh, but yeah, so uh, snails, money makers. Uh, nothing's really a money maker, to be honest with you. Um, uh, to me, this is purely a hobby. I'm not in it for. Even some of the larger uh, breeders and so forth, I think it's, you know, really have to be a hobbyist at heart, first and foremost, to even look at anything from a profitability standpoint, um, due to the fact that uh, my running costs uh, alone are way above and beyond anything I'm going to recoup. And I'm not one to big as far as driving sales. Um, it's just not just not what it, what's in my DNA right now to do it. Probably because I was in sales for so many years that, um, you know, if the word gets out there and somebody wants something that, you know, I hope is healthy and is going to uh, remain around for, you know, any period of time, uh, you know, that's my biggest hope. So if I can just supplement a little bit of this hobby, um, you know, then it go from there. But as far as the overall pricing, I try to be competitive but not undercut a great deal. I have seen my fair share of other. Uh, Pomacia Bridget Eye sta uh, snails uh, through the years and uh, not to toot my own horn but I feel that these are definitely well above and beyond and superior to those uh, you, you're gonna find even local um, and again it really comes down to conditioning and comes down to really keeping it simple stupid at the end of the day um, and that really holds true I think for a lot of things I breed not for just for the snails is to not overthink it don't overcomplicate it Individuals have been breeding for any period of time uh, really simplify things. I've seen some um, Veteran aquarists that have been breeding things for a lot of years and uh, some of their fish rooms I find the most simplistic that you can even imagine um, You know looking at my fish room in comparison to somebody like that and I don't even look at mine as quote-unquote advanced uh, for for any stretch of the imagination uh, but when I've seen some of these other individuals that have bred several hundreds of different species through the years it's just amazing within less than a hundred square feet of what you can actually produce and uh yeah so hopefully that makes sense how often do you have to replace um be honest with you i've had crushed coral um going on for many years and uh the main thing to realize is not how long it's going to last but how long it's going to take to get to the appropriate 
uh, calcification distribution that you're looking for. And I find based on our municipal water source is anywhere between 18 and 21 days. I find it kind of balances itself out to where it's going to increase the overall hardness that I'm looking for. And not just hardness. I'm not looking at crushed coral from that standpoint in order to raise um, when it comes to the overall hardness. I'm really looking at crushed coral in order to provide the appropriate calcium that I'm looking for uh, within each one of our setups more so than the actual buffering um, buffering levels if that makes sense uh, we got fish traffic how you doing so we got 15 minutes you guys I'm not gonna go any longer than this like I said I wanted to just bring a quick quick update video let me know down in the comment section below hopefully this turns out somewhat de decent uh, hopefully it gives you a little bit of insight and inspiration, maybe a little bit of clarification. Like I said, what works here isn't always going to work for you guys. Do your due diligence, do your research, just don't take my word for it. Uh, again, this is what has worked for me through the years, so that's why I want to provide that to you guys. Um, let me know how you like these raw, unedited videos, and that way I can actually be bringing more content to you. This kind of gets me back to my roots of something I enjoy to do. Um, then that way I don't really have any excuses of hey because I know for me and maybe a lot for you guys as well The reason I like doing them this way is once they get saved in a hard drive someplace And I store it in you know an SSD drive or whatever it is within our PC um, I have literally hours upon hours of video that are unedited and at this point it's like do I even go back or do I just redo the video in this fashion then that way at least I know it's going to get out to you guys uh, rather than me having to go back and then worry about having to take the time and edit um, generally this is the time I don't sleep as most of you guys are aware I think a lot of us don't uh, in the hobby uh, so with that being said um, generally anywhere between 8 and 9 o'clock and then all throughout the night is the only time I really have uh, because of my son um, and just dealing with life and so forth in general so when it comes to the rest of the time anywhere from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night uh, there isn't much I can do as far as videos and so forth um, just that's that's the way it goes when you have as a lot of you guys are aware uh, kids and that but I really want to say thank you guys very much again the best thing you can do for me is to give me your feedback down in the comments below uh, what you would like to see in the future uh, based on things I've talked about before as long as I can try to do it within you know 12 15 minute video uh, so thank you guys very much um, and I'm not sure if anybody else is live streaming tonight but with that being said you guys always stay encouraged keep on keeping on happy fishing and we'll talk to you guys right back here on the next one.